Good evening. I'd like to begin tonight with the following land acknowledgement. The University of Washington acknowledges the Coast Salish people of this land. The land which touches the shared waters of all tribes and bands within the Suquamish, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot nations. Good evening and welcome to our first in-person Walker Ames lecture in 24 months. It's hard to believe we've been away from you guys for two years. Um, and it feels really good to be back in this space and to see you all again this evening. Um, I'm Yvette Moy. I'm the director of public lectures. We, here, and we are housed in the graduate school here at the University of Washington. Um, we have a few housekeeping items to go through before we begin tonight's lecture. If you haven't done so already, please silence your cellular devices. Um, there's to be no video or audio recording of this evening's lecture. Um, we are recording this lecture, just so you know, um, and it will be up on our YouTube page, um, our YouTube site in about 24 to 48 hours. Um, and then please refrain from taking photographs while our lecturer is at the podium. It's very distracting um, for the speaker and for you. Um, and finally, if you have questions for our speaker this evening, you can email them in to ask, may I ask at uw.edu. As we adapt to in-person events, I want to thank you all for demonstrating patience with us as we find our bearings. The UW has for over 150 years hosted in-person events and lectures, and we've only been working in hybrid mode for about six weeks. So we're gonna, I'm gonna apologize for any missteps or inconveniences you may have um, experienced tonight because we're all learning new things, so thank you. I understand we have some special guests with us this evening. Um, is the Highland Trio attendees here? Did they make it? Oh, no, maybe not. Okay. Well, welcome when they get here. Um, tonight's speaker, UW alumna, Dr. Fiamma Stranio, will be introduced by UW faculty member, Becky Alexander. Dr. Alexander, who is the director of the University of Washington program on climate change, is also an atmospheric scientist. She studies the feedbacks that arise between climate change and the chemical composition of the atmosphere. Please welcome Dr. Becky Alexander. Great, thanks Yvette. I'm Becky Alexander, director of the UW program on climate change and professor of atmospheric sciences. I am honored to introduce Dr. Fiamma Stranio. Dr. Stranio is a professor in polar climate and oceans and the co-director of the Polar Center at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography at the University of California, San Diego. Prior to joining Scripps in 2017, she was a senior scientist at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. Her research focuses on the high latitude North Atlantic and Arctic oceans and their interaction with the atmosphere sea ice, and the Greenland ice sheet. One of the things that stands out about Dr. Strania's research is her work with the local Greenland, Greenland Inuit community using kayaks, small boats, and inexpensive instruments to measure the complex fluid dynamics of cold meltwater encountering the salty ocean around Greenland. This work was foundational in defining a new area of research that has led to a better understanding of Greenland ice sheets contribution to sea level rise. Dr. Strania has led 18 field expeditions to the Arctic and Greenland and collaborates extensively with climate and paleoclimate scientists, glaciologists, and ice sheet modelers. She is a contributing author to the sixth assessment report of the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change for which she chaired the Ocean Forcing Working Group for the Ice Sheet Modeling Intercomparison Project. Dr. Stranio is also co-chair of the Climate and Cryosphere Program of the World Climate Research Program and a co-chair and founder of the Greenland Ice Sheet Ocean Science Network. 
Dr. Strania has been widely recognized as a master communicator. She is a past fellow of the Leopold Leadership Program from Stanford's Woods Institute for the Environment, was awarded the Spirit of Award by the Ocean Sciences Section of the American Geophysical Union in 2016, and was invited to give the Keeling Lecture in 2018. Following a Laurea Cum Laude in Physics in 1993 from the University of Milan in Italy, Dr. Strania obtained her PhD in oceanography in 1999 from the University of Washington, where she studied the details of the ocean response to cooling from the surface. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Fiamma Strania. Thank you, Becky. Uh, thank you to the Graduate School um, and, and the Walker Amos Nomination Committee for inviting me. It's my pleasure to be here. Uh, wonderful to come back um, to the University of Washington. So today I'm going to be talking about some of the work uh, that I've been doing in Greenland. Um, a lot of the work has been carried out, that I'm going to show, has been carried out by students and postdocs working with me um, and many, many collaborators. I won't be able to list all of their names, but um, I'd like you to know this is very collaborative work. So we're going to start off talking about the Greenland Ice Sheet. Um, the Greenland Ice Sheet is a large volume of ice sitting over the island of Greenland. And just some numbers, it's, it's about uh, 2,000 meters. It's a big, that's about 1.2 miles thick on average. If it all melted, it would raise global sea level by uh, 21 feet. And to think of it as a mass of ice doesn't really do it justice because the ice is in, in motion. And one way to think of it is as ice that is connected to its margins through glaciers that are moving it. So this is a nice animation um, of glacier flow. And so the ice sheet is continuously drained by the movement of ice roughly from its center to its margins. And the areas you see here that are blue are these outlet glaciers that terminate into the ocean. There's over 200 marine terminating glaciers around Greenland, and you can think of them as rivers of ice that drain the ice sheet into the ocean. Um, they do it effectively by discharging icebergs. The other way that the ice sheet maintains its balance, so there's net accumulation of snow that turns into ice, uh, over the central part of the ice sheet and the glaciers and surface melt maintain this balance. So one way to, to think about an ice sheet is if the net accumulation, snow turning into ice, is balanced by the surface melt at its margin and the discharge of icebergs at its margin, we say that an ice sheet is in equilibrium. It is preserving its mass. As things change, if the surface melt increases or if the iceberg discharge via the glaciers increases at its margins, uh, the ice sheet will start losing mass if, on the other hand, the accumulation increases with respect to the shedding of ice mechanisms, the ice sheet can gain mass. So over the last few decades, Greenland has been losing mass at an accelerating rate. Roughly, it's lost 5,000 gigatons of ice, um, something like the size of Lake Michigan. Greenland alone, because it's lost ice water that was on land and is now in the ocean, has driven sea level rise up globally by half an inch. Half an inch doesn't sound very much, but if you can imagine the amount of water that you need to raise global sea level, by half an inch once you've sped it over the surface of the earth, that's a lot of water. Um, 
ice sheets have gained and lost mass in the past, but the rate of ice loss that is happening now is something that took glaciologists by surprise, especially in the early 2000s. And one of the characteristics of this ice loss is that glaciers all around Greenland started moving faster. And when a glacier moves faster, it speeds up, it retreats, it ends up discharging more ice into the ocean. So about half of the recent ice loss is due to glaciers speeding up. So I'm an oceanographer, and when these changes were happening in the 2000s, I was um, quite oblivious and happily so. And it wasn't until I um, traveled to the University of Maine, I was researching freshwater in Hudson Strait, and I was giving a talk up there, and I met two glaciologists, uh, Gordon Hamilton and Lee Stearns, and they got very excited because they said, you're an oceanographer, you can measure freshwater. We've been studying these glaciers in Greenland, and one in particular, Helheim Glacier, and it's been crazy over the last few years. It's changed so much, so you should come and maybe measure the freshwater. Um, I was a young scientist at the time. I only had a couple of instruments in my uh, toolbox. And so they showed me what uh, the glacier environment where they were working looked like. And I did some quick maths in my head and said, no, I'm going to lose the two instruments I have. This doesn't look like it's really going to work. Um, but they persisted. And so um, about a year later, we ended up in the field together. And, and that started some work. I have been returning to this environment um, almost yearly for the last uh, 13 or so years. Uh, to the frustration of my family that asks me why I'm not a tro tropical oceanographer like everybody else. <laughs> OK, so let's look at what a glacier looks like. This is actually a um, graphic rendering of Helheim Glacier. It's about six kilometers or about four miles wide. The glacier flows down you, you, from the left hand of the screen, and it has a front. And as you see, the front of it is all covered in ice. Uh, we call this the ice melange. It's actually floating ice, and, and it'll feel like your backyard by the time we're done with this talk. So Helheim is one of Greenland's largest glaciers, and it drains into a fjord. So just like the ones I show in the animation earlier, the fjord is called Sermelik Fjord. You can see it here on the right. Um, so Helheim flows in. Prior to speeding up, it was moving um, something like six kilometers a year. After it sped up, it was moving at almost twice that speed. It also retreated considerably. But if, if you can imagine the glacier, it flows into the fjord, and there's maybe 20 kilometers of ice rubble field, icebergs broken up, that is inaccessible from our observational perspective, and we'll come to that. And then it drains into a fjord that is connected to south east Greenland, the ocean region. So this is what the retreat of Helheim in just a few uh, images looks like. So in just a few years, now remember glaciers are supposed to move really slow. Uh, they're supposed to change really slow. And so when a glacier like Helheim retreats five kilometers and double its flow rate in just a few years, um, this is quite striking. So this is how Helheim evolved. Um, in just a few years. And this is what was really um, raising questions about our understanding of ice flow in the glaciology community. So eventually in 2008, um, we landed in Greenland and in the town of Tesilek. So Tesilek is the largest settlement in East Greenland. And um, it's adjacent to this large fjord with this large glacier. We needed a research vessel, or at least a boat. We had a suitcase full of instruments. I had borrowed a few more. Um, we had a fishing reel, motorized, a generator, and, and little else. 
Eventually we found a boat, not quite a research vessel, but still a boat. Um, most importantly, uh, the boat came with a captain and owner. His name is Akalu Jorgensen, and he's local to this community, which in Greenland means that his ancestors have been living in the settlement for a very long time, and he himself has been living in this region for a really long time. And um, we didn't know too much about the fjord. There were no published charts, uh, no measurements that we had been able to find, and having a local uh, captain was indispensable. None of this field work would have started without him. So you can see that we adapted um, the boat to be a research vessel. You can see the fishing reel, instruments hanging off the side to measure depth, velocity, and some instruments that we were going to leave in the fjord to see what's happening when we're not there to measure it. So we traveled from Tisilak around into the fjord, made our way uh, inside the waters of the fjord, and lowered an instrument that measures temperature and salinity. And um, what we found really surprised us. As we lowered the instrument for the first few hundred meters, we found very cold, fresh water, almost at freezing temperature. And this we expected. The currents around Greenland tend to carry Arctic water. They're cold and fresh. But as the instrument went deeper down, you can see the temperature profiles on the right. The waters beneath this cold and fresh layer were warm and salty. And we went back in September. And, and confirm this. So four degrees Celsius is, might seem a little bit cold uh, for a human, but it's very warm for a glacier. And Helheim is sitting 600 meters down in the ocean. And so at the depth at which the glacier was flowing into the fjord, there were really warm waters. And what this first um, set of measurements told us is something that we weren't sure was happening. So. These are schematic currents in the North Atlantic. The red arrow is the Gulf Stream that turns into the North Atlantic current. We have a lot of names, but ultimately it carries warm, salty waters. And next to Greenland, you see these blue arrows, these cold, fresh waters. So what we had found is that waters from the Atlantic could cross under or mix with some of the Arctic waters, but eventually make their way into the fjords. From a climate perspective, this is important. Um, it makes a connection between the subtropical, tropical Atlantic and the Greenland ice sheet. So one way to think of fjords is you have a large body of ice, the Greenland ice sheet. You have a large body of water, the ocean. They're huge components in our climate system. But any exchange of heat or fresh water has to go through these narrow fjords. And so the fjords, in a sense, are a bottleneck for climate variability in both directions. That was 2008. The following year, we upgraded. We managed to hitch a ride on a Greenpeace vessel. The captain was not as knowledgeable uh, of the fjord. He wasn't knowledgeable of fjords around Greenland at all. But Greenpeace captains are not really scared of anything. So they work just the same. Um, what the the Greenpeace ship had, uh, outside from a non-fearful uh, captain, was a helicopter. And if you remember, there's about 20 kilometers of ice rubble field in front of Helheim. And we were really trying to get the measurements as close to the glacier as we could, because at this point, we're trying to understand how much melting is happening and whether melting had increased um, and could be one of the drivers of glacier change. So we used um, the helicopter to fly over this ice melange and look for patches of open water where we could deploy expendable uh, probes. So the probe hits the water, but then a part scuttles all the way down, and you can measure temperature, measure salinity uh, while you're hovering with the helicopter. Um, and, and eventually, you take off and go do it again. And if you can get four or five probes in this huge 20-kilometer area, that's a good year. 
Um, it's very hard, it's very costly. So what we found with these measurements, um, this is the fjord as we crisscross it with measurements, but this is showing you a section. So the mouth is out here and the glacier is at the other end. And you can see this is temperature. You can see this warm red water all the way to the glacier. But what we saw with these helicopter-based measurements was something new. You, you can sort of see it here in a tongue of warm water that rises and comes out. What we found was that we couldn't explain the properties next to the glacier without uh, somehow adding a large volume of fresh water at depth near the glacier. And, and so what this meant is that this fresh water wasn't actually coming from melting the glacier there, but what we had found evidence was that any surface melting that happens over Helheim was being funneled by the glacier's plumbing system, if you will, a series of holes and crevasses making its way to the bedrock and coming out at the base of the glacier. Why do we care about that? So we care about that because this fresh water that comes in 600 meters down, that's about 1,800 feet depth is fresh and it wants to rise. And it rises in these localized plumes. Think of a smokestack. And sometimes at the edge of glacier, you can, at the edge of Helheim or other glaciers, you can actually see these muddy plumes emerge all the way to the surface. And we care about these muddy plumes because there are two things that control how much melting the ocean can drive of a glacier. The first one is the ocean temperature. That's pretty intuitive. But the second one is the energy, the turbulence that is available to mix heat from the ocean to the ice. A good analogy is if you put an ice cube in your drink and just leave it there, it will melt slowly. But if you put an ice cube in your drink and stir it, it will melt very fast. What you're doing with the stirring is you're increasing the mixing. The plumes are effectively doing this. And um, let's see, this is now a computer simulation based on the measurements at Helheim that shows you this idea of fresh water coming in at the base of the glacier rising. It also carries a lot of the heat upwards. And you can tell it's very turbulent. So um, wh where are we now? We have a glacier, it comes in. We've discovered that there's warm water from the Atlantic coming in um, and melting. We found evidence of melting. We've also discovered that um, fresh water from the top of the glacier melting due to atmospheric uh, melting is coming out at the base of the glacier and can enhance melting. So as we're trying to understand Greenland's glacier, this is important. It means that I can increase the melting of a glacier uh, by raising the ocean temperature. And we know that the waters in the North Atlantic had warmed in these years. So this was one plausible explanation. We also knew that the air temperature above Greenland and in this region had risen. And now we know that when I increase the air temperature, I drive more melting at the surface of the glacier. This water ends up at depth and it increases the ocean driven melting too. So the glacier was being hit by a double uh, effect of warming. And why do glaciers care about melting? When you melt the front of a glacier, you can affect its stability in a number of ways. But the, maybe the best explanation is to think of uh, the melting can reduce by lifting the glacier or causing it to have the friction to ice flow. And so the it's not that we're melting the glaciers away, we are changing the resistance to flow and they are moving faster. So we made many more measurements over the years. I'm just gonna show you a few. Um, we put moorings in the fjord. You're gonna see what that means very shortly. And we found that every time that there's a storm passing along the coast of Greenland, and this is right along the North Atlantic storm track. So there are a lot of storms. Uh, the currents outside of the fjord change and the fjord responds with some really quick flow going in in one direction, out the other. That's what the red and the blue up, those are velocity measurements. 
So there's a lot of this in the fjord. This is important because it means that I can replenish the waters in the fjord very quickly. This is important for the melting. It's also important for things like ecosystems. Uh, we also studied the effect of local winds. This is an ice sheet. Air can get very cold sitting over the ice. As the air gets cold, it gets dense, and it can flow down along the fjord in very, very strong catabatic winds. The locals call them pitterack. In this region, um, they can have hurricane strength. And this particular settlement has some of the strictest building codes on the planet because of that. And so. What I'm showing up uh, are satellite images of one pitterack, one of these events, which in just a few days has completely flushed the, f the ice from the fjord. You can see it's empty by March 16th, and removed the ice on the shelf. So again, very powerful forcings. Um, and we made a lot of progress understanding the fjords, the glacier dynamics, largely through working in teams with scientists from different disciplines, uh, glaciologists, chemical oceanographers, um, engineers, mooring technicians, and a lot of uh, junior people. And so the point here is this is really teamwork and working together. So I'll show some more uh, measurements in, in a while, but now I want to give you an idea. So everything we've learned from working on these systems is through observations. We go, we measure, and then we try to understand what we've measured. And, and the observations are really what is driving the science here because our computer models are not quite there yet. So I want to give you a sample of what one of our research cruises looks like sometimes a slightly bigger boat. Um, it's not all as glamorous as it sounds. We spend a lot of time emptying containers or preparing instruments or chasing vessels. But um, here we go. And let's see.
this is when you let the students pick the music. <laughs> um, so, so this is to give you an idea about, uh, whoa, probably don't want to see this again. Give you an idea of, of the measurements. And, and I really wanted to give you a sense uh, some of it looks, again, exhilarating. Most of it is really hard work with a ton of preparation. All kinds of things go wrong. And, uh, but amazing work by many of the young people who, in the years, have carried the bulk of it. So, so, so we've studied the glaciers and the fjords, and, and this was really driven by understanding Greenland's contribution to sea level rise. And so this is all very well. We're natural scientists. We go out, environmental scientists. We study how things work. We write papers, and we think our job is done. So um, in 2016, then I, I got a call from an ice sheet modeler. And, and her name is Sophie Nowicki. And she said, well, you're studying the interactions of glaciers and ocean. We would like to run ice sheet models for the next assessment report. Uh, of the Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change, the one that just came out. But we need the forcing of the ocean on the ice sheet. And what she was referring to is prior to this assessment report, we had projections of sea level rise. So this is a curve of sea level rise. There's measurements, um, more measurements since we have remote sensing. And then there's two curves, a blue and a red one. And these are the model-based projections. With uncertainty, blue is for a... Uh, more optimistic climate scenario, and red is for a less optimistic, meaning more greenhouse gases scenarios. And there's uncertainties. Sea level rise is not just due to ice sheet mass loss. Uh, there's thermal expansion of the oceans, glaciers on land. But ice sheet mass loss is one contributor. But in these projections, uh, the models didn't really have these glacier speed up changes that we have been talking about, and that's because the ice sheet models, for the most part, for these projections weren't there. So what Sophie wanted is for me and, and to put together a team that would enable them to do projections. And so just to clarify, we have climate models. What I'm showing on the left are the new climate models showing the uh, projection of ocean warming and atmospheric warming around Greenland over the next uh, 60 years. And this is an ensemble of the CMIC-6. We would like to use the output, these projections, to force ice sheet models to see how the ice sheets will change. These two, the climate models and the ice sheet models, are not connected yet. We're not quite there with the physics. But the idea is let's take the output step by step, put it into the ice sheet models, and see what happens. So we talked for a bit, and of course, I said, Sophie, you're crazy. This is very complicated. We don't know how to do it. We're not quite there yet. No, thank you. So um, Sophie persisted and uh, called again. And actually, she called and said, Fiamma, I haven't found anybody else. And so, so again, I said yes. And so we put together a team. Um, again, it's, it's a team with a lot of junior people from different countries. Um, different expertise. We've had experts in ice ocean processes, experts in observations, ice sheet modelers, glaciologists, people who study uh, the atmosphere side of ice sheets, and climate modelers. And we spent two years on Zoom before Zoom was a thing. And uh, at the end, at going around in circles, because this is a very difficult problem, um, Ocean models do not have fjords. So somehow we needed to get the warm water into the fjords. Ice sheet models often don't have calving. They're not quite there yet. So we also had to uh, figure that one out. We did it for Antarctica too, but we won't talk about this. But this is an example of what taking the science that we've learned from those crazy field observations and translating it into something that the models can use. So what you're seeing on the left is how we extrapolate the ocean properties with rules about bathymetry and so on into the fjords of Greenland. And the image of the right shows the creation of a set of physical laws that take what we've learned from the field, that melting matters, uh, that melting is affected at the ocean temperature, but it's also affected by the surface melt. So there's a Q in there somewhere. 
there's TF stands for ocean thermal forcing, and so we can specify a retreat. And I want to show, and we did this for a number of climate models, we produced an output, and, and this is what it looks like for Helheim and Sermelik. So what you're seeing is the ocean temperature change as the clock ticks based on the output of one climate model. And what you're seeing in the upper left corner, if you look, is the retreat of the glacier that this warming or these temperature and atmospheric changes imply. And um, the ice sheet models took this information and made projections. And so in the IPCC report that just came out, we have projections that are based on ice sheet models for Greenland and Antarctica. And the important thing here is maybe not so much the numbers, because we know they're only half right. We still have a long ways to go to get the uncertainties uh, down. But the fact that this is a community that learned to work together, um, it's an international community. Everybody was moving at the same pace. Modeling centers were running their own model, but we were working together. And I think, to me, this is very important. It's achieving scientific progress through collaboration, through working together, through getting the best knowledge in. And it's very different from the competitive science model of a group trying to be first. Okay, so Greenland is melting, and that's not just affecting sea level rise. There are communities living uh, at the perimeter of Greenland. There's about 60,000 people living in Greenland, um, many of them small settlements that depend on hunting and fishing, especially inshore fishing for their survival. And um, so what we're trying to understand now is well, we, we know something about the glaciers. We know something about the ocean. We've been studying the atmosphere. This is a map, many maps, ocean temperature, ice velocity. We're trying to put things together to understand uh, why, for example, the Greenlandic settlements are where they are. So you can see that they're, they're scattered around Greenland, but they're not everywhere. There's very few on the east where I've been working because sea ice keeps that region very cold. Uh, there are many more on the west where the climate is milder. The plot all the way, uh, the third plot shows pro ocean productivity. And so again, for communities that depend on local fishing, the convergence of ocean currents, glaciers, uh, really sets the stage for some of the productive ecosystems that they depend upon. And I, I, so I want to walk you through, this time not a loud, I don't think it's loud, video. This time uh, we're going to walk from the glacier to the town, through the ecosystem, through the people. And the idea here is, is for you to get some sense of how these are not isolated things. But all these physical climate component, the biology, the people are in the end um, what, what comes together in the kind of life that many of the Greenlandic communities um, have been uh, living. I picked the music on this one.
a connection. Uh, it's not by chance that the settlement is next to a large terminating uh, glacier. One, one of the things that glaciers do, as, as we've shown you, is, is um, upwelling. Skip one slide. And, and um, the deeper waters that are coming into this fjord are rich in nutrients. And um, some of the work of Matthias Cape um, here in the audience tonight, but it's showed how important the upwelling of nutrients um, is to supporting the ecosystems in the fjord. So the point that I'm trying to make is, is that there is an interaction of glaciers with the oceans, uh, with the ecosystems, and with the communities that essentially maintains life as it is uh, on the planet in uh, this region. And, and it's wonderful to try and make these connections. And we need to make these connections because um, as the climate is changing, we need to understand how the ecosystems, how the glaciers will respond. So many of the settlements in Greenland are located next to large terminating large marine terminating glaciers because they end up being these hot spots of productivity. Uh, seabirds, marine mammals, uh, zooplankton, fish. And I'm gonna um, end with just, just a thought. What we're doing now as a multidisciplinary team, including some social scientists, is we're trying to put together a history of change uh, over the past where we have records for this region. So atmosphere, ocean, sea ice, we have some glacier records over as long as we have measurements. That's usually less than the last 100 years. There's been variability. We're trying to combine it with projections of what to come and, and trying to work with some of the local communities to see what this might mean for them and bring the ecosystems together. So what, what you can see is that the projections for much of the Arctic are very quickly rising above what has been the variability that these communities have experienced over the last 100 years or so. And while there is uncertainty in the projections by all means, there's less uncertainty about the fact that sea ice is decreasing, we can argue about rate, and that the Arctic is warming at a very rapid rate. So I wanted to convey three things. The first one is that as natural scientists, we're really excited about discovering how things work. We also have a duty to transfer this information to understand how we can live more sustainably on, on this planet. Um, I really made a point Today's large environmental question require collaborative teamwork and um, competition is not useful if it means leaving all kinds of people behind. And the last thing I hope to have conveyed is that nature is amazing and these are amazing places. I'm gonna end with one uh, piece of art. It's not done by me so you don't have to worry, but there's a graphic artist uh, who has been taking inspiration by science, especially science done by women, and has been painting murals um, around the United States. There happens to be here um, next to the university at the Graduate uh, Hotel. It's not this one. But she did make a um, 
mural that is in Oakland, California, that is in part inspired by some of the work that my glaciologist colleagues and I have been doing. And it's called uh, Song of Ice and Fjord. And Amanda's going to read a short um, description of the work in the background. At sunset, ice and sea meet in warm embrace, whispering words only they can hear. New life springs forth, and creatures draw near, hoping to decode the secrets of their exchange, which sweeps across a vast landscape ranging from coastline to desert. So too are scientists seeking to understand the complex interaction between the ice sheet and the ocean, microbes in the sea, and fire and watersheds. The mural challenges viewers to consider the global reach and impact of climate change. A melting glacier at the poles can cause the submergence of a Pacific island. Warming polar regions can cause devastating droughts, wildfires, and coral bleaching. As we heat our planet, a tenuous relationship is thrown into disarray. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna take questions. Um, if you have a question, uh, you can line up on either side. There are microphones uh, and ask your question uh, to Fiamma. Uh, I think there's also an opportunity to email your question, as Yvette said earlier. Although um, I'm going to need either Molly or Yvette to come and wake up this iPad for me so that I can read them if you decide to go that route. I think it was may I ask at, at uw.edu. Uh, so you can either email or uh, make your way over to a microphone for questions. And yes, Molly, you can come wake the iPad up for me, please. <laughs> Fiamma, it's good to see you. Again, thanks for your talk. I was struck by the video of your PhD students are in the lab looking at water samples and a bicycle of a resident of a village, a child or a teenager. Could you talk about a bit more in detail of any of the sort of endearing or awkward moments? I know you talked about boat captains, but what was it like to have science, global science take place Okay, so, so the question, I think if I may summarize it, is, is um, the interaction that we as scientists have with some of the local communities. And, and it was nice to see the little kid on the bicycle. Yeah, um, so we, we engage with the local communities in different ways. Um, we, Obviously, there's still the captains. You've seen many of them in the videos of the ships. So they, they provide safety, transportation. They kind of run the logistics part. Um, we um, are working with some of the schools. So, so the truth is, for, for some years, we had limited interaction, um, perhaps not quite knowing where to interact. Recently, we've built more of a relationship. And in particular, this summer, a lot of this video was from this summer because it, we were there for so long, in part due to COVID restrictions and just reduced flights, everything. We had more time. And so we developed a relationship with uh, one school teacher. At some point, there was an, an, a photo of him and us, and, and we left some instruments, so they're making some measurements with the school kids. We are also working, you know, we asked what kind of information can we provide? We do not have 
uh, the assumption that we know things that are really useful to them. I, I don't think we can presume this, but we might be able, this is a very poor community, this particular uh, one, where the needs are more about jobs or um, mostly employment and, and, and wealth and, and providing opportunities for young people. And so we are working with some of the local tourist people and, and we hope to produce something that involves essentially relating some of the things we found to um, in a ways that they, they can then explain it to tourists who come visit because tourism is one of the main uh, revenues for this region. In time, we're trying to work more with fisheries. Our, our team for one project is, is also looking at um, changes in the ecosystem all the way up to fisheries. That's a very complicated matter. Again, I, we are at the stage of just trying to understand how the variability might inform some of the decisions that are made at a policy level on fisheries around Greenland. So um, there's an emailed question that, um, that I'll ask. As sea level rise is not um, uniform globally, how have local sea level changes impacted the local communities around Greenland? Right. So I won't read it again because you read it. Okay. Okay. That, um, so, so that's correct. Sea level rise, that's an excellent question. It's not uniform and Greenland actually um, has, um, it's, it's likely to see sea level drop um, around its coastlines. So there's two things going on. One, if you remove ice that's sitting over land, the land tends to rebound, it's kept down. The second is that as you take mass away from the Greenland ice sheet, the gravitational attraction that it exerts on the ocean also decreases a little bit. So. No major changes in Greenland yet, but they, there are some harbors which, because the sea level is dropping uh, slowly, are just have some passageways that are made, uh, are becoming inaccessible. There's um, small uh, passageways again where they used to be able to get their small boats across where now they can no longer get their boats across. So sea level rise is not a major um, problem for Greenland. Things like sea ice melt and um, changes in, in the ecosystems, their ability to hunt, travel over the sea ice are much bigger issues right now. didn't start quite so the question is what you know we just completed one uh, assessment report uh, which contains some ice sheet model based projections what's going to happen for the next one which uh, won't be around for until I don't know about seven years from now so that's an excellent question and I, I don't know that I know the answer the hope is that a more coupled so the wiring between the climate models and the ice sheet models will be at a stage that is advanced enough that maybe some um, simulations, some runs will be able to happen without having to do this, we call it offline coupling. One changes first and then you pass the change on to the other one. But I, I'm not sure 
that so so I, I think um, the ice sheet and the ice ocean modeling community is working really hard um, and so so we'll just see we started this work in um, 2017 and we're madly rushed and so we've said well maybe if there's an next iteration it should start at least some years before but I it, it really depends on the progress on some of the um, coupling of ice sheets and ocean. Okay, we have some more. Um, so this one, in the last projection model slides, it looked like the temperature dropped and ice increased from 1940 to 1980. Was that true and what is the cause? So uh, in the slide where I was showing some of the historical measurements, the question is uh, there was a cooling in between, uh, um, I think it was in, in the 70s and 80s. And, and that's true. So, so I think what, what, um, one of the things that we are so trying to convey to some of the communities in Greenland that we're working is that they they have, well, they know, they've lived through warm periods and they've lived through cold periods in the past. And so they actually have stories of how they dealt with years that were really cold and they couldn't get the boats out, but they could hunt over the sea ice or years where they were warm and, and you can get the boats out earlier. And, and they are, of course, very skilled at adapting. Um, and so recognizing that the climate around Greenland has varied in the past, even in the immediate past, and putting this into the perspective of how this variability might help, these past experiences might help in the future, is one of the things that we're hoping to achieve. Uh, ultimately, the 1940s were quite warm in the North Atlantic. We have some evidence uh, that suggests that the glaciers had retreated at that time. This is part of the variability uh, of very much tied to, we think, the ocean circulation that goes through, uh, this region goes through warm phases and cold phases, so there are oscillations in the climate system. And, um, and, I, and these are important, and so if you look at the projections for the ocean, uh, we still have these fluctuations. You can think of the ocean as something that it takes a really long time to warm up and has a really long memory. The atmosphere and the sea ice over this region, though, are uh, not varying as much and are already rising above what the variability was in that uh, region. But yes, uh, World War II period, quite warm, and after that we've had several cold period, especially in the uh, late 80s and early 90s. Um, I know you were there for the ice and not for the animals, but I was fascinated by the whale uh, footage and wanted to know what other animal encounters you had had while you were, were in the, during the research. Right. I was, it really, the, the question is about other animals encounters. Well, I was excited to put the whales in, and by the way, we see whales a lot. This is how we started thinking, wow, this is a really productive system. Um, there are places where there are so many whales congregating and just sitting there eating for so long. Um, the whale sounds were actually a recording uh, made by colleagues, uh, one here in Seattle, one in Greenland, who attached a whale recorder uh, to one of our moorings. And so those are actually whale recordings from just outside the fjord of humpback whales, which is what you were seeing. So we've seen lots of whales. We've seen lots of different kinds of seals. Um, I know there are polar bears in this fjord, but we haven't encountered them which is a good thing, but you saw the hanging polar bear skin. Um, there are quotas for hunting uh, of polar bears and, and uh, different kinds of whales. Uh, there are many species of seals. Um, and um, I, that now I, all the species are gonna escape me, but there are lots of seabirds and um, 
and of course a, a fish population. So it's, it's a, a really interesting ecosystem just as we have Atlantic waters and polar waters coming together here. It's a very unique region because it has both Atlantic warm water species as well as polar species like polar bears. So, so sometimes they fish mackerel, very warm water uh, fish, uh, really close to the same region where you have polar bears swimming around. So this is quite unique to this part of Greenland and it's very much tied to the confluence of, of these different ocean water masses. Thanks, Fiala. Can, can you hear me? Okay. Thanks for your talk. Um, I was wondering, uh, I think a lot of recent work, or some recent work has shown that a lot of the heat in ocean fjords goes into melting um, icebergs as well as the front of the glaciers. Um, and also some work that's shown uh, that melange, um, the, the rubble of icebergs in front of the glacier, um, can really have an effect on how the glacier is advancing and retreating. Um, so I was wondering how that might affect the parameterization that was used in, um, in the model uh, that you were describing, um, and if that might be, I guess you're not sure uh, about AR7 yet, but if that might be accounted for in AR7. Yeah, so the question is um, what, that's lots of things we're missing. So, 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 no, no, the question is, you know, we, I showed you this, this iceberg melange in front of the glaciers, and, and there are theories and some evidence from some glaciers that uh, when this is very solid um, and thick, it can actually one, be one of the things that inhibits a glacier from calving and therefore from retreating, whereas if you remove it, or thin it, it might be one of the things that uh, influences calving. And it is currently not included in the kind of um, work that we did with the ice sheet models. And, and that's correct. And I, I hope, um, the hope is to increase the complexity in parallel to the studies of, of um, the scientists who are really trying to understand the role of, of the ice melange. And, and uh, yes, that's, that's an